Hello and welcome to tutorial number nine. Our topic today is Lewis structures, electron pair geometry, and molecular geometry. Just a quick reminder before we get started that my notes to accompany each and every tutorial are available online through my website and I do highly recommend that you have those in front of you as you go through these tutorial videos. All right, uh, so we already know that molecular compounds form when atoms share their valence electrons to form covalent bonds. Well, we know how to write formulas and we know how to write out full names for molecular compounds. So now we're ready to learn how to draw Lewis structures. And our Lewis structures will represent the way in which those valence electrons are shared between atoms to form those covalent bonds, and therefore they'll represent the way in which those atoms are connected to one another. All right, so atoms can share just two electrons and form just a single bond, like what happens when two atoms of hydrogen share their two valence electrons to form just one single bond in the diatomic molecule hydrogen. So I'm going to label this a single bond and a single bond represents just two electrons being shared. Shared in a covalent bond. Okay, uh, but two atoms can also, sh also share four electrons in a covalent bond, like what happens when two oxygen atoms combine to form a diatomic molecule of oxygen. So I'm going to show that with two lines here. Each line represents two electrons being shared in that bond. And we call this a double bond And remember that a double bond is representing four electrons being shared between those two atoms. So four electrons shared. All right, let's go to another color here and really quickly talk about these pairs of dots that I've written here for the diatomic molecule oxygen. These represent electrons that are not being shared with another atom. They are left to the oxygen alone. They're not shared between the two oxygen atoms. And we call these lone pair electrons. Lone pair electrons. I'll just write E for electrons. And you can see that there's one, two, three, four lone pair of electrons in this diatomic molecule of oxygen. Okay. All right, last but not least, two atoms can share six electrons in a covalent bond called a triple bond. And that's what happens when two nitrogen atoms combine to form a diatomic molecule of nitrogen. Okay, so I'm going to label this a triple bond. And remember that each line is representing two electrons, so two, four, six. This shows six electrons being shared. Okay, and then you can also see that nitrogen uh, as well has lone pair electrons. So I'll go ahead and circle those again in green. Remember that those are electrons that are not being shared with another atom. Okay. okay, so I think it's easiest to start out by talking about the bonding patterns for uh, the nonmetals 
based on their group number. Remember that it's nonmetals that are involved, typically involved, uh, in forming molecular compounds. So we're really focusing on, on the nonmetals in the periodic table. And there are some very typical uh, bonding patterns that a nonmetal will take depending on its group number. So it's a race here, and let's take a look at general bonding patterns. Okay, so remember that it's typically your nonmetals that are involved in the formation of molecular compounds. And the goal of an atom when forming a compound is to achieve octet, that stable noble gas electron configuration with a full valent shell of electron, which is typically eight for octet. There's one exception that we're going to consider here in this tutorial, and that is for hydrogen. Remember that hydrogen just has one valence electron. It is in the first energy level, S sublevel. And remember that an S sublevel can only hold two electrons max. And so hydrogen has a filled valence shell when it just has two electrons. Okay, so hydrogen's octet is just two electrons not eight. Now there are many other exceptions to the octet rule, mostly expanding octets, um, but we are not going to consider that in this tutorial. We are only going to worry about that one little tiny exception uh, for the, such an introductory tutorial. Okay, so let's talk about those general bonding patterns for the nonmetals. There's only one nonmetal in group 1a and it happens to be hydrogen, which we just talked about. Hydrogen has just one valence electron, as a group number implies. And so hydrogen, when it forms a covalent bond, it typically will just form, or always, I should say, will just form one bond to another atom. Okay, so one bond. No lone pairs of electrons. All right, so remember we're just considering nonmetals here. So we're going to scoot all the way over to group 4A. Uh, the nonmetal in group 4A is carbon. And of course, as the group number implies, it has four valence electrons. Okay, so carbon wanting to achieve eight octet, you're going to see carbon sharing all four of its valence electrons in bonds, in covalent bonds, keeping no lone pairs to itself. That's a general pattern. There are exceptions to that, like carbon monoxide, um, but the exceptions are very few and far in between. So we're going to write here for the general bonding pattern for carbon that carbon will typically share all four of its valence electrons in covalent bonds. Now it could do that with four single bonds but it could also do it by forming one double and two single, or two double bonds, and last but not least, one single and one triple. Okay, so four bonds, no lone pairs for carbon. Again, that's a general rule. Okay. Group 5A, such as nitrogen, the nonmetals in group 5A have five valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five. So draw its dot symbol there to represent those five electrons. And the nonmetals in group 5A typically share three to form covalent bonds, but keep a set of lone pair to themselves. Okay, so we'll see group 5A nonmetals usually with three single bonds and a lone pair, or one double and one single and one lone pair, and last but not least, a triple and a lone pair. So let's write down here three bonds, 
one lone pair. Okay, that's a typical bonding pattern for your group five um, non-metals. All right, group 6A, such as oxygen, have six valence electrons, so one, two, three, four, five, and six, okay? Typically, they're going to form two bonds and keep two lone pair electrons to themselves. So, that can happen with two single bonds and two lone pairs, or with a double bond and two lone pairs. So I'm gonna write here two bonds, two lone pairs. Okay. And last but not least, group 7A, such as fluorine, your halogens, in group 7A have seven valence electrons. Okay, so I'm gonna draw two, four, six, seven dots to represent those seven valence electrons. Typically your halogens will form one covalent bond and keep three lone pairs to themselves, okay? So, typical bonding pattern, just one bond, three lone pairs, make that one a little bit bigger. Okay, so one bond, three lone pair that in there, three lone pair of electrons, okay. Group 8A has non-metals as well, um, but remember that group 8A are your noble gases, and your noble gases already have a full valent shell and are therefore very stable and are typically found in their elemental form in nature, not combined in compounds because they are stable the way they are. They don't need to react with other atoms to uh, achieve octet, okay. All right, let's erase all of this. And let's go on to slide two, which has five rules laid out for you uh, for drawing Lewis structures. All right, so rules for drawing Lewis structures. Okay, and I'm not going to write those rules down because they're already on slide two for you. I'm just going to read through them, and as we read through them, I think it is very helpful to apply them to a problem. So as we read through the rules, we'll apply each rule so that we can draw a Lewis structure for ammonia. All right, rule number one. First thing you're gonna do is add up all the valence electrons for the atoms involved in bonding. So for this particular example, we have one nitrogen and we can look at the periodic table and we can find that nitrogen is in group 5A, therefore it has five valence electrons. So let me label here, nitrogen has five. And each hydrogen, hydrogen is in group 1A, so each hydrogen will bring one valence electron. So we've got five, plus three, because there's three hydrogen. We've got eight valence electrons to work with. Okay. So we need to be showing eight valence electrons in our final answer here. We have to account for all of these. All right, rule number two is that we're gonna show single bond connectivity between the atoms. Now this is probably the hardest rule. So I've written an A, B, and a C for some little tips on how to connect the atoms correctly. A tells you that the central atom is typically the one that there is the fewest of. B says if there is one of several atoms, usually they're gonna be written in order for you. So you'll have the order of connectivity from the uh, formula, the chemical formula, and C. C is probably the most helpful. Hydrogen is always gonna be terminal. That makes sense, because hydrogen, we know, can only form one bond. Therefore, it has to be terminal. It can never be covalently bound to more than one atom. 
okay? So clearly our hydrogen are terminal in this case and there's only one way to connect these four atoms and that is to put nitrogen in the middle and draw single bond connectivity to your three hydrogen. Okay, so rule number two is completed for this sample problem that we're doing here, ammonia. Rule number three, now we're going to complete the octet for the atoms bonded to the central atom, but not for hydrogen, because remember hydrogen is already complete with octet, with just one single bond, two electrons being shared. That is hydrogen's octet, okay? So I'm going to write for rule number three, it's not applicable to this particular problem, okay? We are not going to change anything for number three because hydrogen already has its form of octet. All right, rule number four. Okay. We're going to place any leftover electrons on the central atom. So let's check and see how many electrons we have left over. We need to show eight in our final answer. We have so far shown two, four, six. We have two left, so we're going to put them on the central atom, which is nitrogen. Okay, so here we are. Rule number five, if the octet is still not satisfied on your central atom, start forming double or triple bonds as needed. Okay, so let's look at rule number five here. Let's look at all the electrons that we have for each atom, uh, starting with nitrogen, the central atom. We've got two as a lone pair, two in this single bond, two in this single bond, and two in this single bond. So two, four, six, eight. And nitrogen has octet, okay? So rule number five, is not applicable to this problem. We were finished with the problem on rule number four. For ammonia, there is a nitrogen atom in the center, covalently bound through single bonds to three hydrogen atoms, and the nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons as well to complete its octet. Okay. Just real quick before we go on and do one more problem, I'm going to circle the two electrons uh, that are shared for each hydrogen as well so that you can see that hydrogen also has a full valent shell even though that full valent shell is only with two electrons not eight remember that's the one and only exception for us okay so here are the two electrons shared with this hydrogen so that it now has a more stable electron configuration simulating that noble gas helium and for this hydrogen as well as for this hydrogen. Okay, so all of these atoms are satisfied. All right, let's do one more problem, uh, but I'm not going to work too many more because I'm gonna save that for the problem set, problem set number nine. Okay, so let's just do one more here. Carbon dioxide. All right, so we're gonna draw a Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. Rule number one. Add up all the valence electrons involved in the bond bonding. So for carbon, it's in group 4A, it has four valence electrons. Oxygen, it's in group 6A, it's got six electrons, but there are two of them. So we've got 12 for the two oxygen, and we've got four for the one carbon. So we have a total of 16 valence electrons. Rule number two, let's do it right here. Show single bond connectivity between the atoms. Remember the tips that I gave you uh, on slide two, that typically the central atom is gonna be the one that there's either only one of or the fewest of. So we're gonna put carbon in the center. And just show single bond connectivity to the oxygen, which are gonna be the terminal uh, atoms. All right, rule number three, complete the octet on your terminal atoms, not the central atom. We're going to do that in rule four. So right now, we're only showing two electrons for this oxygen atom. It wants eight. It wants octet. So we're going to add 
two, four, six, to bring that total to two, four, six, eight. And we're gonna do the same thing over here, two, four, six, eight. And then we're gonna go on to rule number four. Okay, if there's anything left over, any uh, valence electrons left over, we're gonna put them on the central atom. So we had 16 to work with. We are currently showing two, four, six, eight, plus another two, four, six, eight, 8 and 8 is 16, so we have 0 left over, so we're not going to be able to do anything for number 4, okay? So we're going to skip on to number 5. I'll go ahead and put it all the way up here. Rule number 5 tells you that if the octet is still not satisfied on the central atom, you're going to form double or triple bonds as needed. Okay, so let's redraw this up here. Let's go to a different color, okay? So my carbon right now only has two, four electrons. It does not have octet. We're going to have to pull in some electrons and share in a double bond. That will give us two, four, six. Still not satisfied, okay? We're gonna keep it symmetrical here for now, unless we have to go to a triple bond. Pull that in, that'll give us two, four, six, eight, and that will complete our octet. So let's finish this problem off with a double bond here and a double bond here, which now just leaves two lone pair electrons on each oxygen. Remember our general bonding pattern rules, okay? They told us to expect carbon to form four bonds and keep no lone pairs. Carbon's following that general bonding pattern. Told us that group six atoms, like oxygen, like to keep two lone pair of electrons and then have two bonding pair of electrons. So a double bond and two lone pairs is very typical for oxygen. Doesn't mean you won't run into exceptions to that rule, you will, but it also helps us to understand why we pulled electrons in from both sides and not all of them from one side, creating a triple bond and a single bond, okay? All right, uh, so let's go ahead and go on to slide number three. Okay, so once you have mastered drawing Lewis structures, you are ready to go on and analyze for the three-dimensional shape, or what we call the molecular geometry, of a molecular compound. Lewis structures really still are just in two dimensions. We're drawing them on the flat paper or white erase board, but molecules are three-dimensional and will represent their three-dimensional shapes by naming their molecular geometries. Okay, so let's write molecular geometry here. Well, let's write electron pair geometry and molecular geometry. And the molecular geometry is really just based on VSEPR theory, which stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And it sounds kind of horrifying, but it's really not. It's really very simple. It just tells you, Vesper theory just tells you that electron clouds being like charge, they're full of negative electrons, um, these electron clouds repel. And they're going to repel each other so as to position themselves as far apart in three-dimensional space. And that leads to highly predictable shapes for our molecules. Okay, so I'm gonna write a couple little notes about that here. So electron clouds, which can be bonding electrons, but also lone pairs. Electron clouds repel one another. Okay, they're full of negative electrons and like charge repels. And they're going to repel <clears throat> 
so as to place themselves as far apart in three-dimensional space as possible. And this leads to highly predictable shapes. Or what we call molecular geometries. Okay. Alright, so I have uh, a table already on slide three for you and I'm just going to copy down the information from slide three on the board here and we'll go through uh, molecular geometries for simple small molecular compounds. We're not going to get into really large compounds just yet so we're staying in the realm of uh, like three to five atoms. Okay so let's say that we have a molecule with a central atom, and I'm going to keep it generic here, so I'm just going to draw a ball to represent an atom, uh, bound just to two other atoms. Again, keeping it general, so don't worry about is it hydrogen or is it oxygen or what is it, it doesn't matter at this point. Okay. Then we would say that this uh, central atom, okay, so we're always with respect to the central atom here, has two bonds. So number of bonds, two. Okay. I'm not indicating any lone pairs on here, so I'm going to say zero lone pair of electrons on this central atom. Okay. So we would say that there are two charge clouds, because remember charge clouds uh, include all of your bonding electrons as well as all, all of your lone pair electrons. So there's two charge clouds here. So how far apart in three-dimensional space can two charge clouds be from one another? They're going to repel to a 180 degree angle. Okay, so I'm going to go to the blue here. You're going to have a 180 degree angle here. If it were any larger on that side, then notice that the angle would get smaller than 180 on this side. So those electrons are repelling maximum distance apart in three-dimensional space the maximum distance that two charge clouds can get is 180 degrees. That leads to an electron pair geometry. Your electron pair geometry accounts for all of the charge clouds, both bonding and lone pairs. Okay, that means that the electron pair geometry is going to be linear. They're all going to be in a line. So we would call this a linear electron pair geometry. Okay. Now, when you go to your molecular geometry, your molecular geometry only accounts for the atoms bonded together, not the lone pairs. Well, in this case, there are no lone pairs, so your electron pair geometry is going to be the same as your molecular geometry, a molecule with an atom covalently bound to two other atoms, no lone pairs, so therefore two charge clouds is going to have a linear shape. And I just so happen to have an example right here. I have made a uh, little model for carbon dioxide. And let's write our example up here. Okay, so what we're saying about carbon dioxide is that that carbon atom has two sets of bonding electrons. Two charge clouds that are bonding electrons. On that carbon, there are no lone pairs. There's lone pairs on the oxygen, but remember the shape is with respect to that central atom, which in this case is carbon. Okay, so what's the maximum distance apart that this charge cloud can get from this charge cloud? It's 180 degrees, and that's why we know that our carbon dioxide molecules are going to have a linear molecular geometry. And this is really important for when we go on and we start talking about uh, characteristics 
of things like carbon dioxide and water and why things have the boiling points and the melting points and the surface tension that they do. Okay, so uh, this will come back to haunt you. So make sure that you, you are following along and understanding this. All right. Okay, so what if we have uh, three or four atoms? Let's erase that arrow just so I don't get too cluttered up here. Where the central atom is covalently bound to three other atoms. So we have, with respect to the central atom, we have three bonding sets of electrons and no lone pairs. Okay. So in this case, how far apart can three charged clouds get in three-dimensional space? It's not quite as easy as just two, okay? Uh, they're going to be able to get 120 degrees apart only. So the angles here are going to be 120, 120, and 120. All right, so the electron pair geometry, which remember accounts for all of your bonding and lone pair electrons, but all these just happen to be bonding, okay? So the electron pair geometry we would call trigonal planar. And because there are no lone pairs, your molecular geometry is actually going to be the same. Also trigonal planar. I have seen some introductory textbooks call this planar triangular, uh, so don't let that throw you off if your textbook uses uh, that terminology instead. Okay, so I have a little model up here for uh, formaldehyde. Okay, so I've got a carbon covalently bound to an oxygen by a double bond, and then two single bonds just to hydrogen. And this is a great example of a molecular compound that has a trigonal planar geometry, again, with respect to the carbon. So planar, because if you look at it, they are all, all four atoms are in the same plane. And trigonal, it's got like a little triangular shape here, 120, 120, and 120 degree angles. Right here, here, and here. So I hope that those models are large enough for you to see in these videos. All right, so let's go on. Okay, let's say that we have an atom with two bonding uh, sets of electrons, but now let's throw in a lone pair of electrons, where a lone pair of electrons is still full of negative electron density. It still repels the bonding pairs of electrons. It still wants its fair share of space. Okay, so we're still going to see a bond angle of about 120 here. Now, I don't want you to think I'm lying to you, so I am going to squeak in a little side note here that lone pair of electrons actually take up a little bit more uh, than their fair fair share of space, so the bond angle here would actually be a little bit greater, but it's negligible for an introductory chemistry class, so I'm going to go ahead and just label them all 120. And you can write approximately 120 if you want. Okay. Alright, so we're finally seeing a lone pair of electrons in there. Alright, so number of bonds, two. One, two. Number of lone pairs, one. Okay. So our electron pair geometry is still going to account for three charge clouds. So it's still going to be trigonal planar. It accounts for all of the charge clouds. Okay. But the molecular geometry really just focuses in on the shape of the molecule and doesn't include the lone pair of electrons, although those lone pairs are important for dictating this bond angle. Okay, without that lone pair, what would this be? It would be linear, right? So the lone pair is important. 
Okay, so knowing the Lewis structure is very important. But when we actually name the molecular geometry, we're just going to look at the shape of these three atoms. And you can see that it makes a little bent shape. And that's what we call the molecular geometry. Aren't you glad that they make so much sense? Bent. It looks bent. Let's take a look at an example. Okay, so I have here a model for sulfur dioxide. So I'm going to take off, this is just representing my lone pair of electrons, so you can see what we get, where we get the trigonal planar from, okay, for all three charge clouds. But when we actually name the molecular geometry, we just want to know the shape of the atoms involved in that molecule. And you can see that they are nice and bent, not linear, very important here, not linear because of that lone pair of electrons. Okay. All right, let's go on. Let's say that we have, see, I want to go in order here. So yeah, let's say that we have uh, one atom covalently bound to four other atoms. And I'm going to make a little wedge here to indicate that this atom is coming out of this two-dimensional plane of the white erase board. And I'm going to make a little dashed line here to indicate that one of those atoms is going to be going into the plane of a white erase board. And you'll find that to be very common uh, in your introductory chemistry textbooks. They'll use this wedge and this dashed line to try to show three-dimensional shape, even though it's on a two-dimensional piece of paper. All right, so what do we have here? We have one, two, three, four bonds. That's not tr trying to show lone pairs. Okay, remember that little dashed line is just trying to show that my bond is going into the plane of the whiteboard. We have zero lone pairs. Okay. We call the electron pair geometry when you have four bonding pairs, four charge clouds, I should say, when you have four charge clouds. The maximum distance apart that they can get in three dimensional space is 109.5 degrees. And that goes for all of these, uh, but I'm just going to label one. Okay. Well, we call that electron pair geometry tetrahedral. And because all of the charge clouds are bonding electrons, no lone pairs, the molecular geometry is going to be the same, tetrahedral. Okay. So I have, as an example of that, made a model for methane, CH4. Okay, so my carbon here, and I'm going to put two hydrogens in the plane of the, the white erase board. And then you can see that this hydrogen is coming out of my plane, and this hydrogen is going into the plane of the white erase board. So typically, we'll just draw a Lewis structure like this. It's up to you to recognize that this would have four charge clouds, which are going to repel maximum distance apart in three-dimensional space, which is going to be 109.5 degrees, not 90. Even though we draw it like that, we're just being lazy and drawing it two-dimensionally like this, it is not a 90-degree angle. It is 109.5. They can actually get further apart than just 90 degrees in three-dimensional space, and they will, and they do. And we call that a tetrahedral molecular geometry. Okay. <clears throat> let's erase that extra drawing I did there. And let's go on to another example here. And let's say in our next example that we have three bonding. I'll still do the wedge and the dashed. And then we have one lone pair of electrons. So, number of bonds is three, number of lone pairs is one, <clears throat> still 109.5 degrees apart in three-dimensional space because there's still one, two, three, four charge clouds. The lone pair of electron wants its fair share of space. Okay, so still a tetrahedral 
electron pair geometry, which remember accounts for all of the charge clouds, bonding and lone pairs. But when we go to the molecular geometry, we're just going to account for the atoms themselves. So ignore the lone pair, even though they do dictate that bond angle of 109.5. Okay, ignore the lone pair, and we're left with a little pyramid. And so we call this shape pyramidal. And a good example is ammonia, one of the examples that we did for Lewis structures uh, on slide number two. Okay, so we've got nitrogen with its lone pair of electrons. That's not very good there, dashed line. If there was no lone pair, and we just had three charge clouds, it would be trigonal planar. So it is very, very important that you recognize that that lone pair is going to take up its fair share of space and create a 109.5 degree bond angle, okay? A tetrahedral electron pair geometry but when we actually name the molecular geometry, we're just looking at the atoms themselves and how are they related to one another. Well, it's got this little pyramidal shape. Okay. It's not flat, it's not trigonal planar. It's like a little pyramid. So at least the names make sense. Okay. All right, last but not least, if we have an atom and it's got two bonds, and two lone pairs. Okay, so here's my two lone pairs. Then we have two bonds, two lone pairs, total of four charge clouds still. Okay, so still a 109.5 degree angle between each um, charge cloud. All right, so the electron pair geometry still accounts for uh, those four charge clouds and therefore is still tetrahedral. But the molecular geometry is just looking at the atoms themselves. The lone pairs dictate that this bond angle will be 109.5 rather than linear, right? If there were no lone pairs, we'd just be talking about a linear molecule. Okay, but there's two lone pairs there they're going to have a bent, once again, we see a bent molecular geometry. So bent here, okay. Great example of that is water, H2O, okay. So a Lewis structure for water would look like this. Two lone pairs on the oxygen, which I have with these little green flaps. Kind of looks like a little fly or something. And then two bonds, one to each hydrogen. Okay, so when we look at the shape of just the atoms in the molecule, you can see that it is, in fact, bent. The lone pairs dictate that. If there were no lone pairs, then two charge clouds would be 180 degrees apart in three-dimensional space. So it is very important to think about those lone pairs and make sure that you understand that they are also going to be taking up their fair share of space. Okay. All right. So that concludes our tutorial number nine. I hope you will consider tuning in to Problem Set 9 where we will work lots and lots of problems. Thank you.